I was uh, just watching an interesting video from English Jackass. I like his videos. Um, and um, it's interesting he was talking about a vegan who was quarreling with the more, um, I don't know, negative or morbid antinatalist set. Um, and um, I've had my dealings with the antinatalist types and it's something that it's an issue that's always fascinated me the idea of whether or not life is worth living um, you'll notice that uh, I am definitely not an antinatalist I um, grappled with the entire issue uh, prior to having kids actually <laughs> prior to breeding and the you know the um, my dealings with the most negative of them all actually left me confident enough to breed so it, it's interesting that you know my, <laughs> however <laughs> however horrible they they may come across to some people and apparently this vegan thinks that they're pretty horrible um, I think that they have their uses <laughs> you know it's uh, if you look at the moniker that I go by on my channel here um, it's on a contavad, which is uh, a term that is generally associated with Jainism but it's not exclusive to it. You see it in many traditions. Uh, you see it in Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism even. Um, and uh, But I'm not a Jain. <laughs> I just had uh, some fish sushi today that my wife made for me and it was very good and I, you know, if we go out tonight to dinner it's, uh, you know, there may be meat on the menu. So I'm certainly not a vegan or, an, or a Jain. But I've learned a great deal from dealing with these sorts of things. And one of the fascinating things that um, that uh, dealing with the uh, antinatalist set, the negative ones, uh, was this idea of ethics by denunciation, where you don't really have to do anything except for um, denounce the bad people out there who are um, doing bad things. Now, this idea is as old as ethical thinking is. There are elements of this in the oldest of the Old Testament stories of some, what Nietzsche would call an ascetic priest denouncing King David or something like this uh, for his failure to be a good person. And You know, it's, it's a very old idea, as is the idea that life is a horrible thing. Again, I, um, my moniker, Anakantavad, is generally seen as a Jain idea, and the Jains kind of share certain aspects of the antinatalist philosophy uh, with modern antinatalists um, along with the Gnostics uh, from the ancient world and even before that um, the idea that the physical universe is horrible or that life itself is a perversion of nature or whatever is also a very old idea and it's interesting that you know um, a lot of people haven't really sort of refined their own ethical thinking until they come across something like, you know, ethelism or whatever, where, um, where you know, say vegans sometimes, if you think of PETA or whatever, they sometimes get a bit strident. Uh, I won't say that they all do. I have no reason to paint all vegans this way or even most of them or whatever, but I've just seen this kind of thing where, you know, people just say it's so horrible, it's so unethical, it's so brutal that you're just a, a despicable human being if you eat meat or wear leather or anything like this. Okay, <laughs> along come the uh, ethelists and they turn the tables on them. The denouncers are in turn denounced. Um, ethics by denunciation. And, you know, we know where that leads. It's, uh, you know, the old thing that the French revolutionary, uh, I forget who it was, said the, rev the revolution is like Saturn in that it devours all of its own children. The French Revolution kind of began as a denunciation of the French upper classes and then the denouncers all denounced each other and next thing you know, uh, the greatest grand denouncer of them all, or supposedly, Robespierre, is climbing the steps of the guillotine himself. Um, you know, it, it, it really brings one's ethical thinking out into sharp relief, I think, when you get the idea of you shouldn't do that because it's a bad thing to do and only bad people do that and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's an interesting sort, and, and, and I particularly appreciate the fact that it, it takes on the dimensions of a religion to some people because it's a question of blind, visceral uh, belief uh, that they will, you know, defend uh, and persist in with all the zeal of any other kind of religious fanatic um, of the denunciatory sort, <laughs> you know. 
uh, you know, the thundering Old Testament uh, prophet or the, the evangelical Christian pastor from the 19th century who is just out to tell you that you are a bad person and you must prepare to meet thy God. Same thing. It's. It, it, I think that that mentality is always going to be with us. And it's kind of neat, though, as I say, when, <laughs> um, I, I said that I found that my dealings with the antinatalist type, uh, types that are particularly negative have helped me. <laughs> because um, occasionally I run across vegans who denounce, 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 and I say, oh, yeah, well, let me just denounce you. <gasps> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, you hadn't thought of that, had you? Because, <laughs> you know, it always, you know, there's always somebody who's more rigorous in their ideological adherence than you are. That's just the way denunciation works. Um, you can always get outflanked by somebody who accuses you of being lax in your uh, moral fiber or whatever. Um, another interesting thing that came up, I was talking to Johnny Nomates, I think he's called in the, in the um, comment section, where I'm dealing with my favorite one, where they have determinism and personal responsibility or guilt or I don't know what you should call it obligation moral imperatives or whatever I would say that well if you actually believe in sort of or subscribe to the idea of determinism or at least as I understand it as I understand say hard determinism or whatever all your actions are determined you can't do other than what you were determined to do that seems to take all autonomy out of your hands and in fact I might even argue that seems to sort of negate your own identity and it actually in many ways negates the idea of identity itself. I don't think that, say, determinism and identity are compatible. Um, because, you know, uh, you see behind me a room. Well, all that is is matter, energy, and empty space. All that this uh, phone that I've got in my hand that I'm um, uh, filming myself on is matter, energy, and empty space. And all those atoms are as old as the universe or whatever. Um, and they just reconfigured themselves and will continue to reconfigure themselves forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, so identity itself, what, you know, what are these atoms that are this room or what are the atoms that are this phone or that are me itself? What, these atoms are just different reconfigurations that will continue to reconfigure themselves ad infinitum and, and go back to the Big Bang and go forward to whatever resolution the universe has. Identity seems to sort of cease in that context. You need to have something external to the physical universe or to any universe or other than or operating perhaps on a different level um, than, um, than hard determinism for identity to exist. Um, because again, we... Everything that we think is a thing is only a thing because we say it is. <laughs> um, all that it is is just the same stuff that's always been around. It, we're just, you know, it, it's, it's as though the universe were just one great big pile of sand and all we're doing is building different sand castles that rise and fall. It, uh, at the end of the day, it's all the same stuff. Um, it doesn't really, there, there's no actual hard identity to anything ever in a hard deterministic universe. So how can you then say that anything first of all exists and secondly anything is responsible or has any autonomy to do anything or that there are any imperatives to feel a certain way or to act a certain way there isn't <laughs> you know it, I, the mind tends to boggle when you think of the implications of hard determinism um i won't say that i'm not a determinist though but it it, it looks to me as though uh, you know, the, the way that I can see it is, I tend to agree, I think, with Epictetus that there, there is that which is in your control and that which isn't. And that which is in my control is that which is not determined, which I do have some influence over. That which is not in my control is that which is determined. And that seems to make more sense to me. Um, I've often, you know, raised the issue of identity, of, you know, um, of desire or the will sort of and its interplay with determinism um the will i don't really see how we can reconcile that with a hard deterministic universe unless we agree that it, it only exists on a different level and if we have a will or if we don't have a will then we don't have a will not to suffer <laughs> you know, we don't want to avoid anything we're not averse to anything because the aversion is the will 
Um, so the universe simply is, if in a hard deterministic universe, and if there's no will, then there's no suffering. If there's no suffering, there's no nothing. <laughs> like there's no no imperative to do anything. Um, that is, suffering doesn't matter. It, you know, it, if there is no will. But if there is a will, and if there are imperatives, then determinism isn't what we may think it is. It's a really interesting sort of dilemma. And I mentioned the idea of it being Bateson's double bind, this idea that, you know, we do, we have no control over anything, but we still want things, or we are averse to things. Now think about that. Um, I have no control over anything, and yet I still desire things. Okay. How is that going to work? Um... How is that going to actually play out? It doesn't matter if my desires are determined. Um, that's irrelevant. The main point is that I do have them. And desire is a desire for that which is not. <laughs> uh, you don't desire stuff you've already got. or Unless, of course, you desire to keep it, but then that's kind of a negative desire where you desire to not have it taken from you. It's not being taken from me right now because I have it, but, you know, it, that kind of thing. It, it all has to do with desire. And desire and determinism are a fascinating uh, inter, uh, two things to sort of play against each other. Again, you can use, you can say that your desire, you can't desire what you desire, fine. But desire still requires an abstraction. It requires something to desire something else. It doesn't, it's not simply a reaction to something. It's, uh, it's a desire for some sort of abstraction that one can formulate and impose upon to the world, uh, onto the world, onto reality. Something is projecting onto a universe that may be determined. Um, I'm not sure that, that we can say that this operates outside of the, the determined universe, but it may operate on a different level. Um, it's a fascinating uh, thing, and as I say, I brought up Bateson's double bind to sort of say, look at the insanity of this, this sort of um, nuclear uh, or unstoppable force meets the immovable object type dynamic that we have in determinism versus uh, desire. Uh, everything is determined, yet we desire things, or we are averse to things. <laughs> we can't stop that which is going to happen, but we don't want it to happen anyway. <laughs> you know, and think about that. That's a massive double bind. And especially if you want to actually manipulate that kind of thing, or if you want to use it to sort of manipulate people. I've often thought that people like in Mendham do that on purpose to put people into this horrible dilemma that, uh, you know, that they cannot escape from. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, just as an excuse to sort of, you know, I don't know. Whatever, it just to create inner tension or something like that. I, again, I've thought that, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing, this, this business of, uh, of un, you know, positing the view that we do have desires, but negating our ability to do anything about them. Uh, <laughs> even though we do have the obligation to do something about them, i.e., say, to prevent suffering or whatever, say, the vegans again, eh? It does get back to denunciation. If you're a determinist, how are you going to denounce somebody for what they just did when what they did was determined? <laughs> it, it makes no sense. Um, but again, how could you reconcile the two? That's, that's a fascinating thing. And I'm not talking about any ridiculous ideas of compatibilism coming out of the Vatican or anything like that. I'm thinking more along the lines of Epictetus. There is that which is in, in your control and that which isn't. Um, that's interesting. Um, that's a really interesting point of view. Um, how much of anything is in my control? And I would say that a hard determinist is saying nothing is in my control. 